my first argument was based on the origin of the universe. And I argued first that the universe began to exist. And he, here he says, well, but look, there are different multiverse scenarios, various models of the universe. I talked about those in my opening speech and explained that the bohr guth vilenkin theorem applies to those and shows the beginning of the universe. In 2003, Arvin Bohr, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe, which is on average in a state of cosmic expansion throughout its history, cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. Because we don't yet have a quantum theory of gravity, we are not able to provide a physical description of the first split second of the early universe. But the bohr guth vilenkin theorem is independent of any such physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state of the early universe, which some popularizers have misleadingly and inaccurately characterized as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had an absolute beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a so-called multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. Now, of course, highly speculative scenarios like loop quantum gravity models, string models, even closed time-like curves have been proposed to try to avoid this absolute beginning. However, these models are fraught with problems, and the bottom line is that none of these theories, even if true, succeed in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. And then he says, but uh, Vilenkin says that you can avoid the uh, bohr guth vilenkin theorem by positing a contraction prior to this one. In response to the question, does your theorem prove that the universe must have had a beginning, Alex Vilenkin answers, no. But it proves that the expansion of the universe must have had a beginning. You can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. Now, this is a statement from a letter of Vilenkin to Victor Stenger, which is very often quoted out of context by atheists. Let me read you the full context. Vilenkin says, <clears throat> you can evade the theorem by postulating that the universe was contracting prior to some time. This sounds as if there is nothing wrong with having a contraction prior to expansion. But the problem is, that a contracting universe is highly unstable. Small perturbations would cause it to develop all sorts of messy singularities, so it would never make it to the expanding phase. So, he says, if someone asks me whether or not the theorem I proved with Bord and Guth implies that the universe had a beginning, I would say that the short answer is yes. If you are willing to get into subtleties, then the answer is no, but. That is to say, you've got the problem with the messy singularities that prevent re-expansion. So, in fact, the bohr guth vilenkin theorem does imply an absolute beginning of the universe. Dr. Milligan says, but we need a quantum theory of gravity to describe the early universe. The bohr guth vilenkin theorem is independent of that. Vilenkin says, the remarkable thing about this theorem is its sweeping generality. We did not even assume that gravity is described by Einstein's equations. So if Einstein's gravity requires some modification, our conclusion will still hold. So it, it isn't affected by having a quantum gravity uh, description. Here's Vilenkin's conclusion. It is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning.
So, okay, we want to find out about the beginning of the universe, how it began, and we have these three properties. We have the composition of the universe, we have the geometry of the universe, and we have the inhomogeneity, as well as the homogeneity of the universe, and understanding those three. Now, each of the three, the mechanisms to explain that, are they indeed consistent with at least this universe having a beginning? Uh, yeah, all three of these depend crucially on the idea that the universe started out incredibly small and has been expanding dramatically since then. And that's what results in the cooling, which allows these funny processes that create a net baryon number to happen in the early universe, but then clearly they turned off. Mm -hmm. In the present universe, the baryons just sit there yeah. uh, and are stable. Uh, and that's true of the other properties as well. So, yeah, it certainly looks like uh, the universe that we observe around us, uh, the universe as we know it, definitely had a beginning. Uh, that doesn't mean that that beginning was necessarily the ultimate beginning of all of reality. There may have been some prehistory to what we're here calling the beginning, but the universe as we know it certainly began, we think, about 13.7 billion years ago. And the inflation theory, which explains some of those properties so, so wondrously, uh, would engender the possibility of there being other beginnings, but I think you and some others have shown that ultimately there had to be some uh, original, the mother of all beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, that's right. Uh, those issues are still a little unclear. I wouldn't uh, say that those things are shown beyond doubt, uh, but with reasonable assumptions, one could show that even in the context of inflation, with many bubbles forming, um, there would still be somewhere an ultimate beginning.